Let's summarize this entire chapter. On the right side, you can see the different subtopics and the times at which they begin if you want to jump to a specific subtopic. All right, let's start with the mind map. So human eye and colorful world consists of two topics, the human eye and the colorful world. In human eye, we first study the structure of the eye. This is where we learn about the different parts and their functions. And one major function is accommodation. Very frequently asked question, that's why I'm highlighting that. The second major topic in human eye is learning about the different defects, how to correct them. And this is where you can expect your numericals to come from. Now the colorful world can be divided into three parts. The first one is atmospheric refraction, basically seeing how the atmosphere refracts light. Famous example for that is how stars twinkle. The second topic is dispersion. This is the colorful part of the colorful world. And this is basically white light splitting into seven colors. And the example of this would be rainbows. And finally, we learn about scattering, which is not the same thing as dispersion. So, uh, you know, I used to get confused over here a lot. But this is the one of the, re one of the reasons why sky appears blue to us. So with this broad overview, we can now start with the first topic. Let's start the structure of the eye. The outermost layer of the eye, the bulged part, is called the cornea, inside which there is a liquid called the aqueous humor. The word aqueous means water. It's kind of like water. Together, these are responsible for m most of the refraction that happens in our eye. Most of the bending of light in our eye happens over here. The next part is this. Uh, disc strape structure which is called the iris and at the center of the iris there is a hole which is called the pupil. The main job of the iris is to control the size of the pupil. When there is a lot of light the iris makes the pupil smaller and when there is uh, less light the iris makes the pupil larger. Then comes the crystalline lens. It's called crystalline because the lens is made of proteins called crystalline. That's the reason it's called crystalline lens. What does it do? Well, the remaining refraction is done by the lens. Basically, its job is to focus the rays of light onto the retina. This brings us to the retina. The retina is the back part of the eye. Think of it as the screen. It contains all the light sensitive cells. So when light falls on it, these cells convert light into electricity. And then that electricity is sent through a bunch of wire like, like nerves called optic nerves. And these optic nerves send that electricity to the brain and finally your brain receives these signals and says, ah, I see something. Two more important parts. One is the liquid that fills up our entire eye. It's called the vitreous humor. The word vitreous means glass. Basically it's saying that the liquid is transparent like glass. And its main job is to maintain the spherical shape of our eye. Without this liquid, our eye can easily get squashed by the weight of all the stuff that comes on top of it. Now over here, I had a confusion of which humor goes where. How do I remember that? So the way I started remembering it is I imagined that my entire eye is made of glass. This way, the liquid that fills up my eye is the not aqueous humor, because aqueous means water. Ah, the other one, vitreous humor. That's how I remember that this is vitreous humor. And so the other one has to be aqueous humor. That, that basically helps me. And finally, the the muscles that hold our lens, our crystalline lens in place are called the ciliary muscles and their job is accommodation. Since this function is a little detailed, we'll talk about it separately. And so this now brings us to the next topic, accommodation. Feel free to pause and take notes if you need. And of course, these notes, quick notes are provided on the summary article on our website, Khan Academy website. So let's clear all those things out and keep the important ones. So what exactly is accommodation? Accommodation is the eye's ability to adjust the eye lens refracting power. Okay, what does that mean? Imagine you're looking at something far away, then the rays of light will be parallel. And now to see clearly, the lens has to focus those rays onto our retina. I'm ignoring the refraction done by the cornea just to keep the diagram very simple. This means that the incoming light has to be bent by this much amount. That's basically what refraction is all about, right? Now let's see what happens when the object comes closer. As the object comes closer, notice that the incoming rays become more divergent and now to again bend it, focus it onto the retina, the bending required is more. That means now the refracting power, the bending power required by our lens is more. 
So again, if the object come object goes far away, look, the bending power required is less. If the object comes closer, the bending power required is more. So our eyes adjust this refracting power, bending power, depending upon how far the object is. And that's what we call accommodation. But how does it happen? It happens due to the ciliary muscles. When the object comes closer, the ciliary muscles kind of push on the lens, making it bulged, more curved. More curved meaning more refracting power. This is how the power is increased. And of course, when the object goes far away, the eye lens relaxes, the ciliary muscles relax, decreasing the refracting power. When the object comes closer, it bulges, increases, increasing the refracting power. This is accommodation brought to you by ciliary muscles. But there's a limit to this. You see, as the object comes closer, the ciliary muscles keep pushing on our lens, right? But after a point, they just can't squash it anymore. So that means, let's say this is the limit. So that means if the object comes any closer, then the lens will not become any more bulged. And so the rays of light will no longer get focused onto our retina. That means this represents the nearest point to which an object can come and we can still focus it onto our eye. So this point is called the near point of our eye. So if the object comes any closer than the near point, we will not be able to see it clearly. And the average near point of human eye is about 25 centimeters. It's good to remember this number. So our near point is about 25 centimeters. What about the far point? Well, as the object goes farther away, then we can easily focus it on our retina. All we have to do is just relax our eyes. And the farthest we can see, we can see the sun, moon, or all the way up to stars. So the farthest things we can see is virtually infinity, meaning our far point is infinity. Makes sense, right? Now this is true for a normal undefected eye. But what if our eyes are defected? So that now brings us to the next topic, defects in our eye. So there are three major defects that we need to study. The first one is called myopia, meaning nearsightedness. This means that the person can see things which are near to him or her. For example, let's say a person can see things closer than 50 centimeters, meaning any object that comes over here, that person can see it, let's say. I'm gonna put it as green. But let's say that person cannot see any object clearly which is farther than 50 centimeters. So anywhere over here, I'm putting red, that person cannot see it clearly. Then this person is myopic because he can see things close to him. So this means for this person, 50 centimeter is the farthest that person can see. So you see, that person's far point is not infinity. That person's far point is 50 centimeters. So you see, for a myopic eye, the far point is not infinity. The far point gets shifted. The second defect is the exact opposite of this. We call hypermetropia or farsightedness, meaning that person can see things which are far away. For example, let's say there's a girl who can see things farther away than 50 centimeters. So any object is farther away than 50 centimeters, she can see it properly. But let's say that person cannot see any object closer than 50 centimeters. So that's red for her, let's say. Then she is hypermetropic, she's farsighted. Now because 50 centimeter is the closest that she can see, this means her near point has been shifted. Her near point is no longer 25 centimeters, it's 50 centimeters. So for a hypermetropic person, their near point gets shifted. Their far point is fine. And if a person has problem with looking both the far away objects and closer objects, basically both their far point and near point have been shifted, then we will say they have press biopia. This usually happens with old age. So what do we do when we have these defects? Well, we have to correct them. And this brings us to the next topic, correction of the defects. To correct these defects, we need to first know what causes them. So let's start with the first two. Turns out one of these are caused by the e eyeball elongation. The other one is caused by the eyeball shrinkage. But which one causes which? This could be confusing to memorize. So let's think of this logically. So what I like to do first is think about, start with the your normal eye. Remember, if you have a normal eye, then when you're looking at things far away, your eyeballs are very relaxed and they are at the extremely low power. And when you're looking at something very close to you, your eyeballs are extremely stressed and because they're at the highest power, okay? Now, let's take the same eyes and let's elongate those eyeballs and see what happens. If we elongate them, you can see the rays of light tend to get focused in front of the retina. To see the object clearly, we need to refocus it back on the retina. 
How do we do that? To refocus it back on the retina, we need to reduce the amount of bending. Ooh, that means we need to reduce the bending power of our lens. And that can be done very easily over here. You see here, my lens is already at super high power. They're extremely stressed. So if I just relax a little bit, I can reduce that bending power and refocus it back on the retina. And so I can see this object very clearly, no problem. But over here, I cannot relax anymore because my eyeball is already relaxed, most relaxed position, lowest power, it's minimum power. I cannot relax any further. Oh, that means over here, I will not be able to refocus it back on the retina. So if my eyeballs are elongated, I can see things close to me. Ah, that means I am nearsighted. So eyeball elongation causes nearsightedness. And because of this, when I'm looking at things far away, the rays of light get focused in front of the retina. All right, so how do I, how do I correct this? So to reduce the bending power, that's basically what we want to do, I have to use an external lens. Now if I use a convex lens, it adds more converging power. So I'm going to use a concave lens that reduces the bending power, reduces the converging power. And if I use a suitable focal length, then I can refocus it back on the retina. Okay, so next up, what happens if my eyeball shrinks? Well, now what happens is, well, now the rays of light tend to get focused behind the retina. Now, again, to see it properly, I need to refocus it back on the retina. To refocus it back on the retina, I need to increase the bending power. Does that make sense? I need to bend more to refocus it. In which case can I do this? Look, over here, my eyeballs are super relaxed. I can easily just stress a little bit and increase that bending power and I'm fine, I can see it clearly. But over here, I can't stress it more because I'm already stressed out, I am at the highest power. Ooh, that means I can't see this. So you see, if my eyeball shrinks, I can see things far away. Ooh, that means I am farsighted. This is how we can logically see in which case you get nearsighted or farsighted. So over here, because I'm unable to increase my bending power naturally, all I have to do is add an external glass. Which glass will I add, convex or concave? I need to add more bending power, more converging power, right? So I'm going to add a convex lens. Another reason for this could be your eyeballs might be fine, but your lens itself might have unusually high power and unusually low power. Again, don't memorize. Think about this, over here, because the rays of light are being focused in front of the retina, we can guess that if the eyeball's shape is fine, then maybe the lens has an unusually high power. That's why it's bending too much, focusing the rays of light in front of the retina. That could be another cause for nearsightedness. And again, to reduce that power, we are using a diverging lens, a concave lens. Similarly, over here, if your eyeball shape was fine, then another reason could be maybe your eyes don't have enough bending power. And that's why they're not able to bend it and focus it on the retina, it's getting focused behind. And so to add more bending power, more converging power, we are adding a convex lens. So if you practice learning it this way, logically, you don't have to memorize anything and less chances of confusion. Finally, what causes press biopia? That is caused due to the loss of accommodation. Basically, your ciliary muscles wear out and your lens cannot accommodate any further. This happens due to old age, it can happen to anyone. And so how do you correct this? Now since our eyes are unable to see far away objects and very close objects as well, we need a combination of these two lenses. And that is done by building something called a bifocal, or at least that what, that's what we used to build before. So bifocal means com combination of two lenses. So when you want to look far away, you usually look straight ahead. And this is why the top part of the lens corrects for far away objects. And when you want to look something close, like you know, usually reading a book, you usually look down. And so this, so the down part contains the correction for close objects. Okay, now that we have corrected the defects, the next question could be, what should be the power of the lens that we should recommend for our patients? And that now brings us to the numericals of this chapter. Numericals are usually on the correction of nearsightedness and farsightedness. So for example, let's say the question says, the far point of a person is 80 centimeter. Find the nature and the power of the lens required to correct it. This is actually your NCRT problem. How do we solve this? So first let's draw a quick diagram. This means that the person cannot see anything farther than 80 centimeters because it's far point, but he can see closer than 80 centimeters. 
So how do I figure out what is the nature and the power of the glass required? Again, we don't have to remember anything. We just think of it logically. The way I have to think about it is, our glass should be in such a way that if an object is kept at his actual far point, okay, because we are correcting for his far point, remember, for at his actual far point, what is the actual far point? Infinity. Then its image should be formed at his far point. Does that make sense? Then we will be correcting his far point. What is his far point? 80 centimeters. So now that I know what the object distance and the image distance is, I can just go ahead and use the lens formula, figure out what the focal length is or what the power is. And then the, the sign, I have to use this with the sign, so the sign itself will tell me whether it's a converging lens or a diverging lens. So this is the way I like to solve this problem. Similarly, if you had another problem, let's say this point, this time it said that there's a person which is near point of 80 centimeters. Same question. What is the nature of the lens and the uh, power of the correcting lens? Now, that person can see anything farther than 80 centimeters. So his far point is fine, but his near point ha has been messed up. So we need to correct for his near point. Now we do the same logic. Now we say, look, if I kept an object at his actual near point, because we're correcting for the near point this time, which is 25 centimeters, then the glass that I'm using should be in such a way, the lens I'm using should be such a way that the image should now be formed at his near point, that is 80 centimeters. So again, we know the object distance, image distance, use the lens formula, figure out what the focal length is, what the power is, and then the sign will tell us what is the nature of that lens. This wraps up our human eye and we now go to the colorful world. This brings us to the next subtopic, atmospheric refraction. The first consequence of atmosphere refracting light is twinkling of stars. Why do stars twinkle? Light from the star bends multiple times in our atmosphere before reaching our eyes. And because, because the atmospheric conditions are continuously changing, this part taken keeps on changing slightly with time. What does this mean? This means that the amount of rays of light that enter our eyes, that also keeps changing with time. And as a result, the brightness of the star that we keep seeing, that changes with time, causing it to twinkle. The second consequence we have to study is that we can see the sun even when it is below the horizon. How this works is consider a couple of rays of light from the sun which hits our atmosphere. These rays of light would have missed our eyes but because it enters into our atmosphere, a denser medium, the rays bend towards us and now we can see them. And our brain thinks that these rays of light comes from somewhere over here. And therefore we see the sun above the horizon. And this is why even before the sun has risen, or even after the sun sets, we can still see the sun above the horizon. Next up, dispersion. Dispersion refers to the splitting of white light into its constituent colors when it passes through a prism. And to understand how this happens, we need to first look at how a prism works. Let's ignore colors for a minute and shoot a ray of light onto this prism. Then it enters into the denser medium, and so the ray of light will bend towards this normal. And then it exits the prism and enters into the rarer medium. And therefore this time the ray will bend away from this normal. And so the ray bends twice towards the base of the prism. And so the important thing to note is that the emergent ray has changed its direction compared to the incident ray, it's not parallel to it. Okay, so how does this give us colors? First, people thought that the prism was just magically creating colors, but then it was Newton who argued that, uh-uh, the white light already had the colors in it. The prism was just splitting them. I've only shown three colors here, just to keep the diagram simple. But what causes this, Newton argued, is that it's because different colors bend different amount. The red color bends the least, the blue or the violet you can think of bends the most. And to prove his point, Newton kept a second similar prism but inverted. And this time he saw that white light emerged out. Why do we get white light now? Let's see, when I keep the second prism, these rays of light will bend the other way around. They'll bend towards the base of this prism. So that will cancel out this bending, and as a result, we will see the rays of light over here end up traveling straight. And that kind of makes sense because when you go from this prism to this prism, there is no change in the medium, and so the rays would just travel straight. 
And by the way, this is where your NCRT has done a big mistake. In your NCRT, they have assumed that the rays of light will just combine over here to give you white light. That's not what's going to happen. Like I explained, the rays of light will just go straight. They'll definitely not combine. Anyways, now we'll see when it exits the prism, these rays of light will all be parallel to each other. It will, they will all be parallel to the incident ray. Basically, the deviation of this prism is canceling out the deviation of this prism, making the emergent ray parallel to the incident ray. Anyway, so if the rays are not combining, why do I see white light over here? That's because in reality, you don't have just one ray of light. If you consider another similar ray of light, now you will see that the colors of this ray will overlap with the colors of this ray. And so if you have lots and lots of rays, all the colors will overlap. And as a result, when you look from here, you will see white light. That's the actual reason. And why doesn't this happen if I just take a single prism? Well, if, here, if I take another ray of light, sure, it feels like they are combining and overlapping over here, but because the rays are bent, the different colors are bent differently, you see if I go far enough, the colors eventually separate out, and that's why I do see colorations over here. And so the important thing is over here, the rays are all parallel, so they overlap, and that's why we see white. Over here, they are not parallel, and that's why they separate out, giving us colors. Now an application of this person can be seen in rainbows. When white light from the sun enters a raindrop, it acts like a prism and splits it into its constituent colors, dispersion. Most of that light actually exits that raindrop, but we're not interested in that light, so let's get rid of it. The remaining light gets internally reflected and then exits it from this side. And so when you look from here, you get the rainbow. So in a rainbow, you have two refractions, one here and one here, and one reflection. And again, your NCRT has done a couple of mistakes in the drawing. First of all, you can see the red must be at the bottom when it exits, and the violet must be, or the blue must be on the top. They have reversed it over here. And they have shown that after exiting, the red and the violet combines to give you a rainbow. That's wrong. You can see that the red and the violet actually separates out, just like in the prism. So then how do you see the entire rainbow? Well, a single drop doesn't give you an entire rainbow. For example, if you're looking at this drop from here, then you see only the red light from this drop enters your eye, so maybe this drop will only look red to you. But a similar drop somewhere lower in the sky, from that, blue light will enter your eye. And so that drop will look blue to you. And so a rainbow is formed by lots and lots and lots and lots of raindrops. You will always see that the red is on the top, the blue or the violet will always be at the bottom. And that brings us to the final topic, scattering of light. When light passes through a bunch of particles, like say dust particles in the air, or maybe water vapor, or some colloidal particles, these particles will reflect that light in all the direction. This is what we call scattering. So you see, it's very different than dispersion, even though the names are very confusing. Dispersion is all about splitting the white light into constituent colors. Scattering is where the light gets reflected in all directions. We don't call it reflection in all directions, we call it scattering. And now since these particles are scattering red light in all the directions, they, the, these particles will glow red when you look at them from any direction. And this is why when I shine my laser through water, which has a little bit of milk in it, we can see the beam of light. That's basically because the milk particles in the path of that light are scattering that light in all directions, and that's why they're glowing red. This phenomenon of seeing the beam of light due to scattering is called Tyndall effect. Our sky looks blue also due to the same reason. When light hits an atmospheric particle, like say oxygen or nitrogen, they have a tendency to scatter blue light the most, and the red light gets scattered the least, and of course the other colors in between. And so during the daytime, when the white light from the sun enters our atmosphere, almost all the particles scatter blue light everywhere, and that's why our atmosphere looks blue, that's why the sky looks blue. This also means from the incoming white light, a lot of blue is gone. And so the remaining combination of the colors look yellowish to us. And that's why when we look in the direction of the sunlight, the sun looks yellow to us. And the same thing happens during a sunrise or sunset as well. Now the light passes through a much larger region in our atmosphere. And therefore almost all the blue gets scattered out, 
But not just that, all the green and yellow, they also do get scattered out because there are lots of atmospheric particles over here compared to over here. And therefore the only light that survives in the incoming light is the red or orange. And that's why now the sun looks reddish or orangish to us. And so since red light gets scattered the least, they can travel longer distances. And this is why the stop signal or usually the, the danger signals are denoted by red color. And that, my dear friends, summarizes the entire chapter. Yay!